Hello. I read a quote this week. It's been an extraordinary year. Now you might think anybody could have said that or written that, but given who wrote it, I think it almost qualifies for understatement of the year so far. Because it was a quote from the family of Captain Sir Tom Moore. Uh, the news announced this week that, she, that he had died in hospital, uh, having been treated for pneumonia and also contracting COVID-19. An extraordinary year. Well, sure thing, because this man, he turned 100 during the last year, 100 years old, and he, of course, shot to fame because of his uh, exploits walking around his garden to raise money for local NHS charities. And it just kind of mushroomed into this enormous uh, event. He was really in the public spotlight and eventually raising over £32 million for those charities. He was knighted. He had a personal audience with the Queen. He had a top hit single, uh, You'll Never Walk Alone. And the list goes on and on. Not the sort of thing you'd expect to happen in your 100th year. But somehow he seems to have captured the, the, the heart of the nation and to typify that sort of spirit of optimism in the face of so much darkness and difficulty. Apparently a very humble man, very simple man, very independent, very clear spoken and lucid and sadly missed by his family and friends and our thoughts go to them at this time. It was that thought of receiving public commendation that set me thinking. Uh, there's no disrespect to Captain Sir Tom or any of his family, but the commendations that he's received throughout the past 10 or so months, they are only temporary and they are only partial, really, for only his closest family perhaps knew the man closely and he perhaps even had secrets from them, as we all do. But what about a commendation that lasts forever? A commendation that is true and real. Well, we read in the Bible that there is the possibility of such a commendation from God himself. Not on the basis of the things that we've done, however good they may be, like raising millions of pounds for charity, and giving hope to a, a, a dispirited nation, not just about good words, but a commendation because of what God sees in the heart. Read from Hebrews chapter 11, that famous chapter in the Bible that lists the commendation that God would like to record about people in the history of the Bible. Some of them are named, some of them, just their circumstances, are described. And it begins, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, by faith, the people of old received their commendation. They received their commendation because of their faith, their faith in God. It wasn't just a vague belief, but something that came from the heart something that God saw and was pleased with. And that's the sort of faith that we're talking about, the sort of faith that means you can be commended before God, commended by God. And that commendation is real and lasting. One of my favourite verses in the Bible from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. And that's the crux of biblical faith, trusting in the Lord with all of our heart. Now, we're not to understand that in any way as bypassing rationality, that somehow our reason and intellect are bypassed and put on hold, and we've just got to believe with all of our heart in a kind of an emotional uh, kicking against the fact sort of way. That's not what the Bible means by trusting in the Lord with all of our heart. It's saying that the Lord is the ultimate determining factor. Uh, earlier on in Proverbs, it said, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That right respect for him, that he 
the almighty Lord God and creator. He has infinite wisdom, infinite power. And though we can reason certain things through, there will come a time in our lives when we simply have to trust that he knows best, that what he says really is true, even though to all appearances, to all of our rationality, it seems to be crying out that something is wrong. Things shouldn't be as they are. Trusting in the Lord with all of our heart, that will be tested frequently. Do we really trust in the Lord with all of our heart, with the, the way that we make our choices, the attitudes that we have? Do we trust in the Lord or do we fall back on our own understanding, our own sources of wisdom, our own sources of power to, to fix the problems that we're facing, that are causing us to question and doubt and maybe not trust in the Lord? Maybe it's what other people think about you. What will their views be if I do this or say this? Perhaps we're not even conscious of the reasoning processes that are going on, but, but do we trust in the Lord to keep us when we make a stand for what is right? Or what about when there's that creeping sense of anxiety that comes upon us uh, and we're just full of, of worry in all sorts of different ways? Sometimes, again, perhaps we don't even realise we're doing it. Do we look to ourselves or do we look to the Lord and his promises and his truth as we navigate a way through that? Perhaps it's a lack of resources. That could be financial, could be time, could be emotional resources. Do we battle them, seeking to bolster up our own strength? To understand a situation completely ourselves? Or to trust in the Lord's leading in our circumstances. Battling against that despair that would come from our own ineffectiveness in our ministry, in our work, in our, the roles that we play in our families. Do we think we just got to try harder? Or do we look to the wisdom of the Lord in the scriptures to guide us? And that we, we don't just know these commands and these promises but actually put them into practice. This is the sort of faith that God commends. This is the sort of faith that time and again is demonstrated in Hebrews chapter 11. You're probably familiar with the Bible passage, but do have a read of it for yourselves. All these different uh, characters, sometimes they're referred to as heroes. I'm not sure it's helpful to describe them as heroes because so often in our modern culture, uh, we're building people up to hero status, only for them to then fall back from that in our estimation. But time and again, these believers, these people who trusted in God, who were commended for their faith, took God at his word. They believed in spite of the impossibility of their circumstances. And uh, maybe sometimes in the process of believing, there was failure and, and disbelief. Just looking down at verse 11 about Sarah, she's commended, even though she really struggled to believe the promise that God would bring a child from her womb in her great age and barrenness. She laughed at the idea and yet believed and is commended for that. And the amazing thing is we go on into verse 16, uh, speaking of people who are living their lives, navigating through life, looking beyond, their, their focus is beyond their immediate needs and circumstances, their own immediate priorities, looking beyond that to God's destination, trusting that the Lord would lead them to a place that they had no clear idea about at all. It describes such thinking, but as it is, verse 16, they desire a better country, that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. God is not ashamed to be called our God. If, if his pleasure is upon us, if our faith uh, is rooted in him and his word, he knows us inside out. 
And yet there's nothing that causes him to be ashamed of being associated with us, of having us call upon him in all of our weakness. Living in the public spotlight is difficult. Uh, it seems that Captain Sir Tom has taken in his stride as the many other challenges he's had in his life. But we don't know, do we, what happens behind closed doors, those phone calls that have taken place uh, as the, the media have wanted endless interviews over the last year or so. But living in the, in the public spotlight, wondering if there will be some secret from your past that's going to be discovered. Living in that fear of public shame, having been commended to then be disgraced. What a turnaround. And yet the Lord is saying here that those who put their trust in him day in, day out, yes, through the mistakes and the doubts, but keep on heading in his direction, he will not be ashamed of them. There's, there's nowhere for them to hide. There's no secrets to come out before God because he sees all. And maybe you feel very intimidated by the thought of total transparency before God. We're so used to putting up our barriers, aren't we? Hiding away what we really think, what we really feel, holding our tongue. And, and, and that's a good thing in, in many respects because so easily our, our, our loose words would cause so much harm uh, and so much hurt. But God sees us exactly as we are. And yet he loves us. So rather than being intimidated by that total knowledge of us, he invites us to be set free by that. That there's, there's nothing hidden before him. That we can come to him as we are and trust that he will accept us on condition that our trust is in the one he has provided to give us access, the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, that was the great problem for these believers that are being written to here in this book of Hebrews. They were going to, they were in danger of departing from the faith, of, of turning away from Christ, as viewing there being some other way of sins being dealt with, something more visible, more tangible, more certain, and less troubling in terms of persecution. And there's very strong warnings here not to do that, not to stop trusting, even though things are hard, to see that we are loved by God and that he has good things for us. As I say, it can be uncomfortable being under the spotlight in the public realm. And maybe you've had that experience in the spiritual realm too, under the spotlight of God's word, feeling exposed and far from commended, but rather condemned. Uh, back in Hebrews chapter four, where he's, the writer has been using the illustration of the children of Israel who left Egypt, who had the promised land laid before them, uh, God's city, God's land for them. And yet they did not believe and they were hard hearted and refused to take God at his word. And he reminds him at the end of that illustration in chapter 4 and verse 12, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to, the to the, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account doesn't sound very hopeful, does it? doesn't sound very commending, but rather condemning. What a problem we face with the Bible, with what God has revealed, our true state before him. We cannot hide. But there's great reassurance that immediately follows on in Hebrews 4, chapter 4, verse 14. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time 
of need. We come in the name of Jesus, our great high priest, who knows what it is to trust in God the Father. When things are difficult, when the way ahead seems impossible, and yet to commit himself to the all-wise, all-knowing God. And that's why after this great chapter 11, we, we say, we're told to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. Jesus, our compassionate high priest, knows from experience what it is to be in a world full of sin, to know what it is to suffer for doing God's will and to endure and to receive the prize, to receive the reward, as uh, chapter 12, verse 2, that he sits seated at the right hand of the throne of God, ready there to share with all who will follow him, all who will put their trust in the Lord. What a great prospect to faithfully endure in trusting in the Lord to the end, so that we may share in the glory that's prepared for God's own children. To be part of that eternal commendation. These are my children. I have bought them at tremendous cost. They have endured through so many trials and doubts and fears and opposition. They've lived in a world opposed to God. They've endured temptations from Satan and so many other things, and they have triumphed. All glory to God. The, the theme of having to be there, being commended, uh, and not being full of praise for ourselves, but praise for the one who got us there. The one who took us from the pit, who took us from death and shame and disgrace, who lifted us up, who made us new, and who drew us to himself with such love and at such incredible cost for it was only through the death of Jesus that we could be restored and given this commendation in this way so even as we think of being commended for faith as these old saints were we give glory to God for we would not have believed without him without him making us new without him having pity upon us and restoring us to right knowledge of him so let's look at our motivations for living what is our focus? What is it we really want in life? I'm sure we're not hankering to have the sort of publicity and commendation that uh, Captain Sir Tom has had. Well deserved, I'm sure, and uh, a real encouragement to so many. But I don't expect any of us are expecting that sort of thing to happen to us in the next 12 months. But we can have an extraordinary year ahead of us or however long it is that we're given life on this planet, if we trust in the Lord and do not lean on our own understanding, know him directing our paths. You can have an extraordinary year because you're becoming more like Jesus as you heed the word of God, as you believe it and put it into practice, as your love for God grows and your love for others grows and grows, becoming more like Jesus. He is the author and perfecter of faith. So we stick close to him. We keep our focus. We fix our eyes upon him. How do we do that? Well, surely through the word, through fellowship together with God's people, maybe via a computer at the moment or some other means, but nevertheless a vibrant relationship with other people, other believers, uh, so that we may be built up in our faith, that we may be an encouragement to others too. I desire that many would come to share in that trust in the Lord. And then as we hear God speaking to us through his word, we respond in faith, we respond in prayer, uh, asking him to Fulfill his promises toward us 
in specific situations perhaps. Too often our prayers can perhaps be taken up with asking God to give us the results that we want, leaning on our own understanding, rather than humbly submitting to him that he would enable us to endure in the faith when his answer comes. Trusting his wisdom. Well, thank you for listening and may God bless you as you read his word, perhaps have a read through of Hebrews chapter 11 and 12 and see how you can be encouraged to trust in the Lord and to know God's commendation of your faith to his glory. Amen.